Hello, everyone. Welcome to How to Make Political Change Without Fueling Extremism and Polarization. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today for this very timely and important topic. My name is Michael Soto, and I'm the Chief Advocacy Officer for One Community. As many of you know, One Community is the coalition for socially responsible businesses, organizations, and individuals who are moving diversity, inclusion, equity, and equality forward for all Arizonans. Today, we want to take, uh, we want to talk with our incredible panelists, and I'm so excited that we get to spend some time with Mayor Giles and Sarah Burlingame. These are two of my very favorite people on the entire planet, and they are so brilliant. Um, so just so excited to talk with them about creating change without fueling extremism and political polarization. And this isn't an easy task. This is a big lift. Um, and so we've got two of the four most experts in the country on doing this. So um, throughout our work, we have found that lasting change comes from the hardest of hard work, and that is coalition building, educating, meeting people where they're at. We're going to chat with these two amazing friends and champions of equality who have created so much incredible change in their communities, um, which also happen to be red communities, right? Red states, a red city. Um, so I'm so excited for us to do this deep dive with these two amazing experts. I'm honored to be with them today, and I would really love for both of you to introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, please just share a little bit about yourselves and a little bit about the work that you do in this world um, to create political change, and especially in this way that doesn't feel extremism, but feels connection. Mayor, do you want to jump in? Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Um, well, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I've really enjoyed my association with Michael and, and with one community uh, that they've uh, said God send uh, to us at a time when we were uh, trying to uh, to adopt a non-discrimination ordinance in my city. So, uh, and I've appreciated, and that was a couple of years ago now, and, and I've really appreciated uh, maintaining a, gr a great relationship and continuing to work on, on these important issues. Uh, Personally, I, I've been the, the mayor of Mesa for nine years. Uh, I have one more year to go, and then I'm, I'm termed out, uh, and it, it's been a great experience. Prior to that, I, I practiced law in, in Mesa for 25 years. I'm a, a Mesa native. Um, relevant to this topic, I'm, I'm also a, a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, and that's that's relevant, I think, to our discussions because it was, it was relevant to uh, to the adoption of the ordinance in Mesa. It, that's as as many of you know is is a church that has a a history of not always supporting um, LGBTQ uh, rights, uh, and uh, but they've uh, they've evolved and and I'm I'm grateful for that and uh, I think our the experience in Mesa is is part of that story. Um, I I'm married uh, for forty years to my wife. I have uh, five kids, eight grandkids. Uh, I relevant to LGBTQ issues. I've got some extended family members, of course, that are that are LGBTQ, and and one of my best friends. I, I uh, went through an experience in high school with one of my good friends who came out uh, right after high school and in a very conservative Mormon family, and and uh, kind of suffered with him through uh, you know uh, through that experience, and and we've remained good friends uh, our whole lives. So um, that's kind of me in in a nutshell, relative relevant to this topic and I look forward to to sharing some of the experiences that I've had that I, I think ho hopefully we can learn from. Uh, thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, you're just an incredible leader and uh, as a native Mason as well, <laughs> I just am so proud that you've led our city, uh, our hometown for so many years and wish you could keep leading it. I, I, now we need to get you elected as governor. <laughs> Not <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> would you introduce yourself to, to everyone and share a little bit about Hi. yourself and work? Good morning. Um, I'm so happy to be here with uh, Mayor Giles. We had the opportunity to meet a few years ago after Mesa passed the non-discrimination. And so I've, I've been a fan since, and I'm delighted to get to share a panel with them. And uh, thanks to our friends, Mike Soto and Angela at One Community, and Lauren, who I just met this morning. Um, I'm always happy to jump on anything that one community does because I think that you guys um, are just real leaders in uh, you know, showing people what diversity and equity and inclusion could look like, particularly in rural and red states. So 
I'm Sarah Burlingame, uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of Wyoming Equality and I'm a former member of the Wyoming legislature. I served in House District 44 um, in 2018-19. And, um, you know, my background with uh, working in, uh, you know, with the communities that I do is I grew up in the Intermountain West. Um, I really like to tell people that I spent most of my childhood in Winnemucca, Nevada, and what I like to call a suburb of Winnemucca, um, Golconda, <laughs> that's um, 200 people in it, and it is famous um, for having a hog that got a social security number. So kind of metropolitan, kind of a big deal. Sorry, but we just said we've learned that we cannot talk about hogs in the federal government. It's it's too controversial. We'll shut down the whole thing. Um, yeah. I will move along. Um, yeah, so I mean, I grew up in what you know we call the Jello Belt, right? Like Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, California. Um, so even though I wasn't raised in the LDS Church, my parents were Baha'is, uh, and the Baha'i faith, you know, is an offshoot of Islam. Um, and I, you know, I lived in very small towns growing up, like all along the San Andreas Fault. My dad was a soil scientist. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think it gave me, you know, a unique experience of getting to grow up in a faith that was marginalized and wasn't mainstream in like small conservative towns. And I think that ability to empathize um, and to, you know, as a kid, I will tell you like, golly, I wish we were like everybody else. You know, I, I wish that I could fit in better um, being a weird little queer kid whose prophet's name was Baha'u'llah, you know, was rough. And I wouldn't trade anything for it now. And now I recognize, you know, that <clears throat> the virtue of growing up in rural America, um, whether you fit in or not, is just having a totally different experience from everybody else. And, um, uh, you know, recognizing sort of, you know, marginal identities that like we're born into every family, we're born into every community. Um, and this idea that, maybe gets promoted over and over of, you know, only metropolitan, you know, only blue states that here we are living our lives <laughs> in these, you know, uh, conservative states in these rural spaces. And that, golly, we sure need, you know, a voice and a place at the table as well. Um, so that's sort of, you know, the, the work that we try to do here at Wyoming Equality. Um, when, my now deputy director, Ammon Medina, first came on and he was writing some grants for us. And he said, you know, this grant would like to know what Wyoming Equality's theory of change is. And um, most theories of change, if you've heard them, are like somewhat academic, you know, and have very sort of, you know, preponderant language around, um, you know, how we will move from point A to point B. And I said, OK, write this down, like exactly as I say it, because this is our theory of change. Um, <clears throat> we believe in sharing meals whenever possible and loving each other as sincerely as we can. And that's it. That's the whole thing. <laughs> and um, I, I believe being guided by this value um, has been able to, you know, have some pretty significant uh, wins, some pretty significant relationships um, that have been formed that are surprising and outside of the silo of where people expect us to be. And I'm excited to get to talk and to learn from you all today uh, in the ways that you're doing this work as well. Aww. Thank you so much, Sarah. I just, that theory of change is the best theory of change. I just love it because that that is actually how we learn ourselves. Uh, that's how I've always changed, right? Is being in close proximity, sharing life with other people. It's so beautiful. That's why y'all are leading the country in this work for the LGBTQ community. And I just can't say enough about how much I adore you. So, <laughs> but this, I probably shouldn't do that for the whole webinar. Just like talk about how much I respect and love both of you. <laughs> so, so Sarah, you're from a very conservative state, the most conservative state in the union um, and in Wyoming, joining us from Cheyenne this morning. And Mayor Giles, you are from one of the most conservative communities in Arizona um, and one of the most conservative cities in the country. And so... Can you both share just a little bit uh, with with our with our amazing audience that's here to learn today about 
how you build supportive coalitions in and unlikely allies. Um, how do you do that in these places, um, especially for bettering the lives of highly marginalized people like LGBTQ people. Um, what has, what's worked for you? Um, what hasn't worked? Uh, what are sort of the lessons that you've learned over doing this work? And just jump in when you, when you're ready. Um, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll kick it off in that. I, I, I love Sarah's approach. I mean, breaking bread with people. Wow. I mean, that's, I mean, we could just wrap things up right now and just say, uh, take a lot of, take people to lunch, you know, uh, that's the, the takeaway from this When I grew up in, in Mesa, there was a, uh, there was a, some, uh, angst, you know, the, the LDS church was viewed by some other, by the non LDS community as being overbearing. And, and, um, so there, there wasn't always a good relationship between the, the faith groups. And there was a gentleman that, that, uh, famously, you know, worked really hard. He, he would take a, a different pastor to lunch, you know, and uh and just break down you know the the the, the trustworthiness uh issue right and and so that i um i think that's that's uh a great lesson for all of us to learn you know pe people support what they help to create right and and I, i'm fond of saying that uh, that success has many parents and failure is an orphan so i mean i, th I think it if, if we have some goals to uh, to do things like non-discrimination ordinances or uh, the, the more the more colleagues you have, right, that, that come along for the ride and, and they have a, some skin in the game, uh, you know, they're they're if they're advocates for it, they're not going to be <laughs> fighting against it. Right. Uh, so that was certainly our, our experience in Mesa. With, and, and Michael has heard me tell this story countless times, but but it took us a long time in Mesa. But it was, uh, you know, a, a really a seven year journey to, to, to get it ha to happen from beginning to end. I, I was kind of full of vim and vigor at the beginning of my term to do this. And uh, we spent a lot of time and energy on it. And we were on the cusp. We were this close to pulling the trigger. And, you know, the um, religious right uh, folks in, in, in our community that were gearing up to fight us, they walked into my office and they said, here's our polling. And it's from a, a reputable polling firm. Uh, if you do this, we'll file a referendum and we will win. And they were right. You know, uh, it was uh, it, it was they weren't just blowing smoke. Uh, and so I could see at that point that there was a lot of more work that I had to do, you know, before we walked into that to that arena or, or we were going to have our, you know, we were going to lose. Uh, and so we, we hit pause. And then I went about this journey of creating this coalition that, that you've implied is is important and it took a few years and it, it took going to a lot of church meetings you know and uh creating some some trust uh with with the with the religious right you know and, and so that they uh the people that were going to be that the champions against you know fighting this uh, either became allies or they said you know what we don't like it but we're gonna we won't fight it uh, and so they, I think we talk about meeting people where they're at and, you know, there's a we're all evolving from one point to another and you kind of got to take people where they're at. And and so um, so that's what in, that was the ultimately the, the, the winning formula in Mesa. And uh, so that that, that like I said, it, it could all, it all, all boils down to Sarah's uh, suggestion that we that we eat with each other and just create friendships and, and tr have a, have a, a, some trust in our relationships. Well, I, this is going to be a mutual admiration society <laughs> because I think the final thing that the mayor said, which is have some trust in the relationships, I would say that that was the thing that I didn't do as well when I first came on, you know, at Wyoming Equality, because I felt like, great, you know, we've shared a meal, we've had a coffee, we've created this, now vote the way I need you to vote. <laughs> um, and I, I think I've I had, you know, any sort of like wisdom to impart of, you know, what I've learned over these last eight years at, you know, Wyoming Equality is that that's not the way <laughs> and that it really is. It's about building that trust and um, letting people become comfortable. And all of that sort of conversation about like building trust and letting people um, become comfortable is sort of anathema to what's happening on sort of, you know, the extreme 
you know, left side, which is this sort of excoriating purity and this idea that like, I need you to wake up this morning. I need you to have a different understanding about gender, about sexual orientation than the one that you were taught your entire life. And you were taught it at your church. You were taught it in your school. You were taught it at your dining room table at night, <laughs> you know, in all of those places, you had one message told to you over and over. And now we've had a coffee. We've had a lunch. I've introduced you to someone and I need you to flip. And if you don't, then you're a bigot and you, you failed and you're doing um, a very specific kind of harm. And boy, should nobody send their business to you. <laughs> and that's one way to do it. And, and, you know, I, I'm absolutely in support of people who <clears throat> hold a very strict line and, um, you know, do this advocacy in a different way. It's just not ours. You know, like I, I recognize that there's got to be some sticks for the carrots as well. But here, like, you know, Michael was saying, we're the most conservative state in the country, like by every metric. So um, our top five electeds are all Republicans. Other states have a super majority in their legislative bodies. We have like a hyper super majority um, in our house out of 62 seats, there are only five Democrats and our Senate out of 31 seats, there are only two Democrats. Um, in 2016, Wyoming tied with West Virginia as the state that voted most overwhelmingly for then President Trump. And in 2020, we were number one or number 50, depending on how you see it. I would go with 50, but um, I also won't quibble with anyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're the most conservative state in the country. And so like the other part I think about being in coalition with folks and finding common cause is knowing who you are. Because a lot of people, you know, they look at Wyoming and they see, you know, how profoundly conservative our culture uh, and, and our politics are. And so they think that they can sort of swap us with what they know of Oklahoma or Florida or Texas, right? Like conservative is conservative. And yet that's not true at all for us. Um, the most conservative state in the country is also one of the only states, uh, the only red state who resisted these um, uh, anti-gender affirming care bans. We are, we had a 45 year track year, track record until this last year of defeating every single anti-LGBTQ bill in <clears throat> like every single one for 45 straight years, anything that limited the civil rights of LGBTQ people. And so if you don't know us, and if you think like conservative Wyoming is the same as conservative Texas, then you don't understand that like our culture is so deeply libertarian. And like at Wyoming Equality, like we're liberty loving people. <laughs> like we're here to advance the dignity and the rights of the LGBTQ community, but we're here to do it in Wyoming. And so that means understanding who our people are and understanding that sometimes the reason those laws were defeated weren't because people were bought in to the dignity and the worth of the LGBTQ community, it was because they had a specific idea about what is the role of government and those principles held. And those principles held in part because we had relationships that also held. And here, like when you give your word, you give your word. And um, I haven't found that to be true in other places. I found it to be more transactional and more um, sort of like, like we'll go which way the wind goes, you know, which way the money is, you know, sort of, uh, landing for us. And so, uh, you know, my sort of alpha and omega for forming these relationships and being in these coalitions is not walking into the room and thinking, I already know who this person is. I already know what their beliefs are. I know what their church says. I, I know what their mission statement on their, you know, business um, page says but really trying to be open to like, what are they telling me about themselves? You know, what, what is true of us? And, and when we get to that point, then, then we can really meet each other. And then we can meet each other in a way that can withstand a lot, right? Cause like, if you're going to stand in the space in a very conservative place, people are going to come at you and you want people who will stand by you and you want people who have principles 
um, that's really important. And uh, I, I think that's the most rewarding thing about doing this work is finding those unexpected people and getting to build that together. Oh, I love that. You are both just such experts in coalition building in meeting people where they're at. You also both have something in common that a lot of Americans don't have. You've served as elected leaders in public office. Do you think that has um, given you or helped you build a skill set serving in public office um, that has really helped you hone these skills? And can you share a little bit about I don't know, kind of how what you learned from serving in public office that has helped you meet people where they're at um, and build these kinds of coalitions that actually do implement real change. Well, we're we're taught when we go away to you know elected official school to um, to do a lot of the community engagement is important. And so uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, Sarah talked about going, there, we do in, in some regard, uh, we do aspire to go the direction the wind blows, right? Because we are public servants and, and so we want to be respectful of the attitudes and the opinions of the people that we serve. Um, uh, but I, I think obviously we need to temper that with <laughs> doing what's right. And, and, and sometimes uh, doing our best to, to shape public opinion by informing people and advocating for positions. And so there, there's a fine line to be, to be walked there, but you, you absolutely have to be respectful of, of the people that you work for, which is, is the public. And there's, there's always gonna be loud voices in every room you know, uh, that, uh, that don't necessarily reflect the majority opinion of, of the community but they're gonna be the loudest voices in the community. So you need to be uh, respectful of those folks as well. I think anytime we, you know, we, we jump in the, <laughs> wrestle with the pigs, you know, that the, the old saying is that you don't accomplish a whole lot by doing that. So uh, I found it's important to not read the comments on social media, you know, uh, there's not a lot of good that's gonna come out of that. But at the same time, you, you do need to, uh, you know, community engagement is very important. And it, not just because it allows us to know what the public thinks, but it allows us to engage and to explain and to advocate and to, disp you know, it, particularly in topics related to LGBTQ issues, there's always boogeymen, you know, that are, that are uh, used, you know, it, you know, the bathroom ordinance, or yeah, they, they'll just, they'll, they'll paint horrible scenarios and scare people, you know, into, into not supporting uh, the right thing to do. And so we need to use public engagement to to respond to those types of arguments. So important, Sarah. Yeah, I love everything that the mayor says. Like, amen, amen, amen. And and that's, I mean, to his point, right? That like the way that we do blow with the wind is like you can't get too far out ahead. And like his story of like, look, the people don't support it, like that's not bending with the wind. That's saying, oh, hey, we have some more education to do. <laughs> um, I, I I think the thing about running for public office and, and serving in public office that still, you know, strikes me is how the process itself can sometimes sort of take over and sort of narrow you into these sort of like soundbite sort of platform standards. And it takes like an act of will to sort of, you know, push yourself out of them and say, oh, no, I know that there's this heavy expectation that I line up, you know, uniformly and, and purely, you know, with, with this, but it's not true for me. And so the practice of like over and over sort of resisting that pull and just saying the thing that's true, right? And, and being clear, like, you know, the mayor talked about, um, all of these sort of misinformation and you know boogeymans about like the LGBTQ community. Uh, the same thing is true for us with faith, right? Of like coming into those rooms, um, and and here's the anytime contempt is raised for a group, and it's normalized, right? Like oh those people, they're the enemy. We have contempt for them. Get out, like get out. Raise your voice. Say something, right? Be the human in the room who resists that tide uh, and, and, and who sort of says like, I haven't found that to be true. 
Um, like, I don't care if you have to be really hokey and say like, why some of my best friends are Mormons <laughs> or members of the church. Um, like whatever it is, like you have to start carving out that space so that we don't fall in to these really bad patterns of, of behavior that dehumanize and limit us. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's uh, wildly unpopular, but you got to do the wildly unpopular thing. Um, that's uh, hopefully what you got elected for. Uh, and I, I went to a school board meeting the other night that I'm still sort of like, my gears are just like turning on it because it was so shocking to me. Um, but, you know, the opposition, it was about banning books, you know, and they were there to ban books and the school board that was elected was there to make sure those books were banned. Like they had the votes. It was a foregone conclusion. And yet still a mob showed up and they yelled at kids. They booed kids who got up to speak. I mean, the the lack of civility was so shocking from people who are considered kind of, you know, have status in our community. And the thing that I can't like stop, you know, thinking about is just the importance of good manners and civility. And I, I know it can be weaponized and it can be turned into like respectability, but I think that there's nothing more radical and more hard to do than maintain civility, maintain your neighborliness um, in, in times when like violence is on the rise. So um, that's a, a lesson that I've taken away from public service that I'm thinking really deeply about right now and hoping that other people are also. Wow. I, I just, I wish we could like clone you both and put you in like every single community uh, in, in our country and, and do that hard work of talking to everyone about building that muscle for respect, right? Having, uh, working on not having contempt for one another that when, especially when we live different kinds of lives, but instead being neighbors, right? And, oh, that's just, that's the world I want to live in where, where you two lead us all. Uh, I just uh, say uh, amen to something Sarah pointed out, the importance of civility. I, uh, you, you know, you work, Sarah probably lost the battle that night, you know, with regard to banning books, right? But, you never know uh, who she impacted by being there and being and 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 being a class act, right? And and not and and having a civil response to to the controversy. Uh, one of the, I remember when I very first uh, got involved, my first uh, introduction to politics was when I was invited to a a, a precinct meeting back uh, in the days when we we had this very controversial governor in Arizona Evan Meekum and he he had been he was being impeached and there was just a lot of chaos around it and so i was recruited people didn't know they thought i was a conservative republican they invited me to a meeting i didn't i thought i was a conservative republican too i didn't know and but i was you know in my 20 uh, something years old and i walked in this meeting and they were just crucifying this uh, state legislator who was a former mayor of Mesa of a well a highly respected man but he had voted his conscience and voted to uh, impeach this this controversial figure, who was the the darling of the crowd, and they were just they were so rude and brutal and disrespectful. And he uh, maintained his composure and was a perfect gentleman and explained why he did what he did in such a compelling way that I was a totally a convert to his point of view, right? Because I'm the, the contrast between the two sides was so stark. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it, Sarah makes a great point. You know, it, 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 we're going to invite, we're going to encounter a lot, a lot of lack of civility and, and we can't succumb to the, to the temptation to respond in like kind. Oh, it's so true. Uh, we've got to, got to, you know, take the higher road, right? Michelle Obama, right? When, when they go low, we go high, right? We got to, got to keep that respect for everyone and that love for everyone um today we see a lot of especially in highly engaged political uh, people who are highly engaged in the political system whether elected officials or just folks in your community that are deeply invested in um in politics we see a lot of debate around um should change be done incrementally right kind of one step at a time do we um, you know, do we sort of identify long-term goals and then get there over the course of time? Or 
uh, should we do change uh, only if we get like, should we be working for an issue only if we can get everything we want, right? Everything we could possibly want in that in that time, um, and sort of that purity politics, right? Of like, this is this is the big vision, and we're gonna work for only that, and nothing short of that is good enough. Um, from your experiences, how have you approached that, and how have how have these different kinds of change worked in your communities and in the work that you do? Oh, Mayor, you're on mute. Um, this was clearly uh, an issue in the Mason non-discrimination case. We, we, we were initially approached by LGBTQ advocates that said, hey, we understand that Mesa is a conservative city so man anything we could get here we'll be grateful for and and I, so i kind of said oh you know okay and, and I, ultimately they won me over i said yeah let, let's go do it but it's going to be kind of a watered down you know thing and then the next time they met they said no let's not do that let's let's make it something that we can be proud of and i thought well yeah you're right you know it, but ultimately they they kept moving the 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 goalposts on me to the point that that they said, we're only going to be happy if you have the absolute most progressive non-discrimination ordinance in the entire country. You know, it's got to be more progressive than San Francisco, you know, and and I'm like, dude, really? I mean, that's that that can't happen here, you know. Uh, and so ultimately, we uh, I, I, I appreciated the, you know, uh, the advocacy and not settling for something that was really just, uh, you know, uh, for show but and didn't have any substance to it and so ultimately we came up with a with an ordinance that's progressive that that's a, that's really uh very effective i mean it it, it addresses uh public accommodation in, in ways that other state you know cities don't uh, that are from conservative areas and, and anyway it's a very good ordinance but it still didn't get the you know the the, the seal of approval from the most progressive uh lgbtq organizations but uh again i that that was out of necessity. We, it could not have been any other way. So I, I think, yeah, the, the, this idea that you know perfect ought to be the enemy of good is is doesn't work. I think in this setting, or I, 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 I think we do need to challenge uh, attitudes. But at some point, you've got to, to to realize that a lot of the attitudes around this this topic are generational. They're going to be slow in evolution. And uh, like you said, we got to take people where you find them. You know, the, 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 a lot of these evangelicals or African American churches that, you know, at, at the beginning of these conversations are like, "I'm not," you know, "this is 100% wrong." I'm not giving you an inch. If they give you, you know, a few feet, take it. You know. Amen. 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 <laughs> take it. And say thank you. Right. Like, not like begrudgingly, like, okay, I guess we'll take some expanded civil rights. But like, yeah, thank you. This is movement. And it's not a political talking point. It will impact people's lives, right? Like people will have security, will have dignity, will have access to civil rights that they didn't have before this. Like, that's actually really important. It's not just like, uh, yeah, I, sometimes that gets lost in it. So I'm an incrementalist, you know, by nature, by temperament, um, but I'm also somebody who really, really believes in the ecosystem of, of advocacy. And I know that I have my role to play and I know that I'm not fit to be a revolutionary because I think revolutionaries kind of have to have, ironically, a binary sort of, you know, here's the good guys and the bad guys. And in my heart, like, I just, I can't believe it. It, it will never feel true to me, um, but it feels true for some other people. And I know that, you know, um, that Malcolm helped create the space, you know, for uh, Dr. King. You know, I, I know that the revolutionaries and the people who hold the line and stricter places, that it would be unfair and um, hypocritical for me to not recognize uh, the role that they play. I, I was also, I had a great conversation with Melvin Bray, who Mike Soto and I worked with um, yesterday. And he was saying, you know, civil rights, you know, the way that we did it back in the sixties 
worked in a different way because it was um, evoking people's shame. And when people are shameless, you can't evoke it. <laughs> I think that's right. I, I think that's, you know, accurate. So, um, I mean, I just, I, I believe, you know, the, the role that I have to play is um, walking into these rooms and being very clear about who I am, what my values are, and what we represent. And I think that some people believe that if you're incremental or you're attempting to, you know, form new coalitions, whether it's with businesses or churches or the military or people who've been seen as outside of your movement, that everybody just sort of dummies themselves down until you meet into a sort of happy mediocrity where you can meet. <laughs> and I think that is nonsense. I don't think there's anything beautiful or transcendent or effective in that kind of, you know, uh, dumbing down until you can meet each other. I think if you walk into the room and you're very clear about what your values are, but you're also very clear that like, you're there to learn, you're there to listen, and you're there to find the places where you do uh, agree. Like I work very well with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I love the church. I love the people. I love so much about it. And I wasn't raised in the church. I do have some pain that's associated with it from friends, you know, who've been hurt, you know, by the church. Um, but it's not the same as, you know, folks who carry this, you know, deeper associative pain with it. <clears throat> and so for them, I say like, you know, like my deputy director who was raised in the church and served a mission, like, it's not work he wants to do. He's got his own stuff with it, which is fair, right? Which is like, not everybody has to do all kinds of work. And I'm never going to erase that experience or say like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, the church has only ever done things that have had a net gain for LGBTQ people in the world. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it, right? Like, I'm not going to say that. It's not true. It's not accurate. I'm going to name the places where like hurt and harm have happened but I'm also not stuck in a place where I need the church to be eternally castigated or shamed for their role in something. Like I'm, I'm here for us to work together and I'm here to name the powerful impact that they have had when they have stepped into that role. And I, I think it, it's no more dishonorable to not name that than it is to ignore the other stuff. We're humans. We exist in this space of complexity. And um, if we can name it, I, I think, you know, we do better work together. Absolutely. You both are so wonderful at working for LGBTQ people and our very real rights and needs, everyday needs, right? You both have created change in your communities um, and contributed to creating change in this country um, that actually makes life tangibly better for LGBTQ people um, of all stripes and all kinds. And you're great at working with faith communities and like bringing these two things together, which I think a lot of people are always shocked by, right? They're like, wait, how do we, how do I get these two groups to stand together and do work together? Can you all, you, you both alluded to work that you've done in that area. Can you share a little bit about why for you in, in your leadership style and in the way that you understand making change, why this is such a powerful group of, or combination of people to work with. Um, and some things you've learned from that work. So the question is, is why uh, kind of go out of your way to engage in the faith community? Yeah. And the LGBTQ community and both of them, right? Why, why put these groups <laughs> together that, that people yeah. often see as oppositional? Well, number one, there are two very strong communities, right? I mean, uh, if you want to get something done in my community, uh, the most, one of the, I mean, high schools are strong organizations, I've come to find out, and faith communities are strong organizations. So uh, after that, you know, the, the Rotary Club is not that big a deal, you know, compared to, uh, or, uh, to, to those, to, you know, those two groups. So uh, that's where the people are. I mean, well, you know, um, why do you rob banks? That's where the money is, you know? So why, why do you, uh, do you need to work with faith groups and the LGBT communities? Because that's where people, uh, uh, you know, with, with character and with commitment and, uh, are, are at, and, and that's where 
you need to go to get stuff done. Uh, I work with our faith community on a lot of issues, not not just LGBTQ issues, because uh, because that's for, for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, you know, what, during the pandemic, uh, when we needed to get stuff done, when we needed to organize, you know, adopt a grandparent organizations, because I had all these uh, these folks with medical issues that were standing in line, you know, getting food uh, when they were uh, elderly, and and I they had they had no safety net. I needed the faith community to to come in and 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 fill that void, and and that's just and you know multiply that by a lot of other things that we need to engage with on. So, um, so, I mean, I, I, I've said in the past at, 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 uh, one community events, I, I love going, being there, being in the room because it seems like a convention of nice people. And, and the same is true in the faith communities, right? I mean, that's where, um, the, sometimes we have disagreements in, among each other, but, but I think we still love each other and respect each other. And, and, um, I think it's a perfect marriage. My, my you know, uh, Michael and, and Angela are always telling me, you know, LGBTQ people are the same as everybody else, the same as straight people. I don't believe that for a second. I think they're a lot nicer. And I, I just I like associating, you know, um, I, I think they, they do a lot of things better than straight people. Uh, but uh, but for that reason, you know, I'm, I'm drawn, I'm compelled, you know, to to seek out relationships and to spend time with 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 folks in the LGBTQ community. The same is true in the faith community. Right. I mean, when I, I walk into a, a church, whether it's mine or, or someone else's, and I, I love the vibe, you know, it, you, you can tell that if there's a family uh, feeling there, you know, people that uh, take care of each other. And uh, and so it's a perfect match, really. There, I mean, it, I, I, a lot of times I tell people there's not the church and LGBTQ community. The, the church is the LGBTQ community. People of, of faith, you know, LGBTQ people are people of faith uh, to a large extent. I know there's a lot, there's some that, that are, have been scarred, you know, uh, by that. But for, for the most part, I see, you know, there's a huge Venn diagram, you know, between LGBTQ and faith. It, it's the same thing. Uh, so I, I think we need to embrace that and, and not treat it like there's, it's either or. I'm so in love with like a convention of nice people. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got our gala all themed out, Ernest. <laughs> You're invited, Mayor. We will call it some some theme of a convention of nice people. Um, sorry, I'm so taken with that. I cannot remember what I was going to say. Um, I, I guess you know, wh why I find myself in these, you know, spaces is because I, I think, you know, that's where all the power is for me. Um, you know, it feels transformative, it feels transcendental, and I'm kind of a junkie for it. <laughs> like, um, showing up and having people, you know, be honest, you know, about who they are and, and finding those places where, you know, our humanity can like rise to the top it gives you such faith. It gives you such faith that like, oh man, there's really strong forces right now encouraging everyone to hate each other's guts in very specific and organized ways. Like that's real. You know, I mean, I, I love the organization. I always mix up their name. I'm not sure if it's Braver Angels or Better Angels, but they're really just, you know, addressing like how polarized our country has become and how like, we're not just going to drift back together. Like it will take very intentional, very, very mindful effort to do it. Um, <clears throat> and so that's the work that I think there is to be done. If you love your country, I love my country. If you love your state, I love Wyoming. <laughs> if you love your people, then that's the work that there is to do. And on, on the flip side of that, that is, um, you know, perhaps not as, as, as sunny and is just more pragmatic. But when I look at, who's organizing against the LGBTQ community and our civil rights, um, it's communities of faith, right? So like the old, you know, pay attention to the wound, that's where the light comes in. Like that's the wound right now. And Michael and, you know, one community, I think are part of this network of people who have recognized that if we fight one form of extremism with another, 
if we meet their dehumanization with our own, <laughs> but that's a zero sum game and it can't propel us forward. The unfortunate thing is this is wildly popular <laughs> right now and people fund it and people write stories about it and people invest in it as um, a unique good. And it's it's not. It's um, part of which you know tears us apart and makes it hard to do the work of democracy, you know, together. So I think there's never been a time that's been more vital. I think if this is something that you know you are looking for a way to get engaged in, now's the time, right? Like the republic needs it. Uh, it needs people to come forward, uh, say the true thing, and to stand beside your neighbors, even if it costs you something, and know that we'll be standing with you. And that's a pretty good place to be. That's a wonderful place to be, especially because you're both there. Uh, so I always want to be standing next to you too. Um, so as we kind of get ready to wrap up here, I keep thinking about this next year, right? 2024, we're a couple weeks away now, which feels like impossible to me. I can't believe it's going to be 2024 very shortly. Um, we, I think I feel a general anxiety from pretty much everyone I talk to and myself about this year, about the presidential election. It feels like there's a lot of uncertainty. It feels like people are, you know, being pushed by very concerted efforts to push people further from each other based on their parties and uh, who they want to vote for and all of these different things or even based on uh, beliefs and then that should lead them to voting for someone in particular. How, what advice can you give to folks on this call, to folks watching this later um, about next year, about how to get through this year in a way that brings us a little closer instead of pushing us further and further apart. Well, yeah, yeah I, I share your, uh, it's easy to be pessimistic, you know, and, and afraid of, of what this next year is going to, going to be. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I go back to Sarah's experience at the, uh, at the school board meeting, you know, I think we're, we're, we're about to go to a lot of school board meetings, whether we want to or not, you know, over the next, uh, uh, not literally, but, you know, we're going to be in that environment a lot. Um, and, and, uh, there's a possible, you know, don't underestimate the other side, you know, they've won before or they could win again. And so I think we need to be motivated to, uh, to work hard, um, to get people out to vote and to, to, to advocate for the positions that we believe in, but, uh, also realize that, we might lose, you know, and, and so we need to maintain our dignity and we need to, to set the stage, you know, like, like, uh, to win next time by, by not taking the bait and, uh, and engaging in, and being less than civil, right? Um, I, there's, uh, a lot of these attitudes, like I said, are generational. And, and so you, you, uh, I think our best days are ahead of us because, uh, if, if the situation is evolving. And um, and time will catch up with us at some point. And then a lot of these attitudes that, that we're trying to uh, to change will change, you know, because of generational changes. I, and I, I know I, it, that that's that's got to be very disciplined. You know, I'm not asking people to wait for a generation to die before, you know, the world gets better. But but I think we just need to all you can do is all you can do, you know, and, and let's uh, let's wear ourselves out fighting for a good cause. Uh, and then whatever the outcome is, just keep wearing ourselves out, <laughs> finding for good causes. Amen. Um, yeah, I think I see things very similar uh, to the mayor, which is I am not assured of a good outcome, right? Like I think I think the black hats might win, um, which I find terrifying, just terrifying for what it means. And it's funny to be, you know, like a lefty queer advocate who's like, I feel like Chicken Little saying like, it's the rule of law, people. It's the constitution. It's it's the process which we should shed blood for. It will protect us, but it is being jettisoned. It is, it is being thrown into the wood chipper right now. 
And now is the time to, and, you know, I think this is why we don't get, you know, funded or uh, our stories lifted up as much. Saying I'm here to rally for the process is like one of the unsexiest things you could say, right? Like nobody, they're like, could you give us something with more? I'm like, this time it's personal, like the flag or something. And it's like, I'm here for the process. And, and that's what's at stake. Um, but the process is actually salvific, right? It is the thing that gives dignity to us, that, that, that promises that we are seen and understood in the laws of our country and the most foundational documents. And that's what we're fighting for. And I mean, that's what, you know, uh, my hope is that we all sort of like the mayor says, you know, like kind of reverse engineer it and say like, you know, it's, it's 2024, it's election day. What will we have wished that we had done? What conversations will we wish we had been brave enough to say? And we've really been working with people to say, recognizing that there's so much anxiety about how polarized we are. And so folks are like, look, I'm not gonna spend Thanksgiving dinner or you know, my time at the orthodontist office doing a deep dive <laughs> into the political machinations of my church and state and this election, you know, like that doesn't feel like a good use of my time. Agreed. That is not a good use of your time. And just letting everybody know that like, that doesn't need to be your commitment. Like your commitment, if somebody says something that um, promotes what I think of as fascism, right? Like losing the rule of law and promoting a sort of like might equals right. Um, if somebody says something that denigrates like the dignity of of queer people or of people of faith, you don't have to do a deep dive. All you have to say is, I haven't found that to be true. Or I don't think that's kind. Saying I don't think that's kind over and over helps restore sort of the balance of like what was missing at that school board meeting, right? Because if we normalize cruelty and if we normalize sort of the most craven uh, you know, despotic impulses and say, well, it's, it's just how things get done. Then, you know, there's, there's so many fewer common threads for us to hold on to and to knit ourselves back together with. And uh, we need a lot of knitters right now. So I'm hoping that folks uh, who are, you know, participating in this conversation in any way, um, really like crafting. <laughs> it's, it's time to knit. I love that. Uh, this is we need uh, more Mormon moms, right? Uh, teaching us how to do the crafting and the knitting. I love it. <laughs> One of the best groups to go to if you need something really done. That was the story in Mesa. It's been the story of the work in Wyoming. I know, y'all. I am so inspired by y'all. I'm gonna. We're we're almost out of time, and I'm just gonna ask y'all for final thoughts on you know, how to be knitters, how can we be that in our communities and how can we help other people be that, um, every day? Like that's, I feel like that's kind of the call is how can we actually, how can people on this call? Cause you two do this professionally, you do this expertly, but how can an everyday person do that in their families and their workplace, in their communities and their churches, man, uh, I think it is important for everybody to feel like they have a calling in this regard and that, you know, not uh, that in spite of the pessimism that I may have expressed earlier, you know, I, 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 I you know, good will come from activate activation on, on, on this. And you know, even if it's in, uh, in your small circle of friends, but I mean, challenge yourself, you know, to, to speak up, you know, uh, silence is acquiescence, you know, as I, uh, but, but I, uh, as I said, uh, a few ca campaign or two ago when I was endorsing some people, the people didn't think I, I should, right? So um, I think uh, speak up and uh, do it in a respectful way and um, uh, uh, don't be silent. Um, but at the same time, uh, be, um, you know, don't stoop to the, uh, to the level that, that you're not, you know, that you're not going to be proud of yourself, you know, afterwards when you're, you're maybe your, your blood pressures come down to, you know, and you're analyzing if you handle things correctly or not. Um, but I, I think, uh, 
you know, at the end of the day, when we're lying on our deathbeds, you know, we'll we'll be proud of of ourselves if we if we didn't if we did speak up and we we did our best and we, you know, like Sarah said, we uh, we fought for the Constitution and we fought for the rule of law and and those are all noble causes. You know, I can't remember who it was that says that the best cause, you know, the only causes worth fighting for are lost causes. I don't think this is a lost cause, but you know, still. Uh, it's that they're they're certainly the most rewarding causes to to be fighting for, um, and um, so I, I'm I'm in spite of my natural pessimism I I I I get a thrill out of uh, out of trying to change attitudes and uh, sometimes being in the minority. Amen. There is a thrill to being in the minority when you're grounded and like, I know this is the right thing. And I appreciate the mayor saying, you know, that when he wanted to endorse people that people were like, oh no, you know, like that's, that's unpopular. Like these people won't, won't like him. Pay attention to when, when you were silenced, right? Like pay attention to when something that you know is true and people are saying, you can't say that. That should offend you. That should offend you as an American, as a freedom loving person, that there are things that you are not allowed to say and claim it, like reown it and say, like, oh, absolutely not. Like, I will take the consequences for it. I, I, or what is the um, choose the right? Like, let the consequences follow. I like that, right? That, like, when you are grounded in the truth, and I, I think the way to do that is, you know, you got to be accountable to your community. Like that's how you get grounded. Like you, you know, you know, what affects us, you know, um, what is harming us and you know, true principles. I, I think that a lot of good, you know, can flow from that. Um, I just think that, you know, the thing that's true about us as, as humans is, we always react when it's a little bit too late <laughs> and I'm not different. You know, I, I think, um, you know, I, I just, you know, we, we will see when, you know, the walls start to crumble a little bit more, right. But like, Oh, I don't want that. I, I don't mean that. But I think that everybody has the the power of, of their voice in their community. And I think, you know, if folks are looking for w more ways, you know, to get involved, I think just having that discernment and saying, what is the thing that is true for me? Like, what is this truth that I'm going to stand on? And then finding ways that you can show up in unexpected places. Like we have all become very, very siloed, very siloed. And, and of course, like we're being policed to the point of like, I can't say that, you know, if I say that, you know, uh, I, I will, I, I will be canceled, uh, unto death. Um, so an act of resistance is is saying the things that people don't want you to say. And uh, my a good friend of mine, she's a singer songwriter named Jolie Holland. And she has this song that was written after the civil war and it has this lyric in it. And it, and it says something like, um, I'll, I'll see you in the sunrise after the battle is won. And I want your hand in mine. I want you by my side as we face that great victory. And I just, you know, I remember, you know, Walt Whitman and the folks who were writing around the time that America was as polarized to the point of war. And I think of how they still found each other and how they still committed to this country, even knowing that we were capable of crimes and violence and the work that they put in to make it true. And I think those are our ancestors. They're our ancestors. And um, that's who we could be right now. You know, we could be standing side by side and we, we could be working to create that victory. So I, I hope folks are standing side by side. Wow. I just adore you both. I'm so thrilled to be able to start the day with you. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and your experience and your love for our country, for our people, uh, with our audience. I just am um, anywhere you all are. That's where I want to be. I know that. So I will always be there to stand with you. So thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much, Sarah. You are the best. And 
yeah, just a master class on making change and bringing people together. Thank you for, so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. <laughs>